Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to Life of Christ One, Life of Christ One. Today, we are going to get into lesson number three of Life of Christ One, lesson number three. We're going to have a great time today in class, and we are going to cover in lesson number three, we're going to talk about the 400 silent years. Now, I want to tell you up front that I am going to add to some of these notes and kind of take it in a little bit of a direction I think will apply more to the life and times of Christ and kind of apply to our own lives. And so I'm going to add to our notes. We'll use the notes for a foundation, but I'm going to add some additional content, some supplemental material. If you have any questions about this material, please feel free to ask me. And I will do my very, very best to answer all the questions that you may have. And again, uh, as I say a lot, if I don't know the answer, I will do my very best to find someone who does. And then I will relay that uh, information to you. And through that, we can both learn together. So let's get ready to go into Life of Christ 1, lesson number 3, 400 silent years. But before we do that... Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us today in class that God could bring this together and help us to learn and do his will. Lord, we love you. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for all you're doing in our lives. God, I am praying a special anointing and blessing upon every student today. God, I pray that they'd be able to have breakthrough in their lives every day, but especially right now as we are in this season of our lives where we have engaged ourselves and given ourselves to the work of the ministry, to learning at Acts Bible School. And I pray, God, that you would reward them for their sacrifice, their commitment to you. I pray, God, that you would cleanse my mind. Help me today. Forgive me, Lord. Don't let anything come between me and your word today. Let it be a blessing. Help us, God, to say this in a way that would be in a, a not only a blessing, but a way that we could learn, that we could understand these things together, these principles. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being in class today. So over the last few lessons in Life of Christ, uh, part one, we have covered the four Gospels, and we talked about when they were written and why they were written, and we got to go into... Uh, the very details of how God shaped each gospel to be tailored to reach a generation, a certain group of people, and that how then the overall gospels are tailored to fit into our lives. And then we talked about the geography of Palestine and the important role that it plays in the location and how that God created that for a uh, very specific pur uh, purpose and how that related to the spread of the gospel. And so today, we're going to begin to study about the 400 silent years. And in studying the 400 silent years, our lesson gives the geopolitical atmosphere of the day, which is very important to understand. But I want to look at this uh, from uh, what was God doing and what was this purpose of the silent years and what was happening. Because... A lot of times we get the idea that when God is silent, that he may not be at work. And that is just simply not true. There's a reason for the silent years. There is a fulfillment of prophecies even during the silent years. And there is a coming together. It is a part of the puzzle of how God works. And so I want us to look at Galatians chapter number 4, Galatians 4, and verse number 3, and we're going to read through verses number 5. But Galatians 4 and verse number 3 says this, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And so this is very powerful text, very familiar text. But when you look at verse number four, it brings out something very critical to our understanding of the 400 silent years. Uh, it says it like this, but when the fullness of time was come. 
So there, there is a timing with the things of God. And we understand that. We know that everything has a timing uh, and, and everything has an appointed purpose uh, under the heavens. We understand that. But this scripture is not just dealing with spiritual things. It is also dealing with literal timing of things as uh, seconds and minutes and hours that turn to days and days turn to weeks and weeks turn to months and months turn to years and so on. It, it, this is literally uh, talking about the fullness of time. That word time there is, is not just a spiritual context. The word time there is literally the, the same word time that we get our word uh, that we use for watches and clocks and of those things. So it is a literal time. It is a calculation of a period between one event and another event. And so when you look at the, the context of this verse, it is talking about when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. So that lets me know that it was a, a purpose and an appointed time that God was manifest in the flesh and came born of a woman in Bethlehem, raised up, went into ministry, then died and rose again. It did not just happen, but there was an appointed time. And so when you look at the silent uh, years or this 400 silent years, this is the intertestamental time. It is between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so this time of silence, and, and I, I kind of put this in, in my notes, I put silent but significant uh, because sometimes we think that it's silent so there must not be anything happening, but that's just not true. It, it, it can be silent, but it can still be a very significant process that has taken place. And so I wrote that down, silent but significant. And there's some uh, very important things in there. Matter of fact, there's things that not only relate to Israel of the Old Testament coming into Israel of the New Testament, ushering in the coming of Messiah, but there are things in that that also relate to our own lives. There are times, and I don't want to get ahead of where I'm going here, but we need to make sure that, that we get the fullness of this lesson. There is a there is a time for everything. There's a time. Ecclesiastes talked about the time appointed unto all of these things. And so uh, as we begin to look through and, and read through how that God appoints things to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh wherein he laboreth? Now, so we've established the fact that timing is important. So why was there 400 silent years? And so to better explain this, uh, we need to define these 400 silent years. It is that in-between period, that intertestamental period between the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the beginning of the New Covenant. So when did it start? When did this timing, this silent years uh, begin? And when did it, uh, when did it end? Well, that's a, a very good question because we understand that that God moved in such a way that he designed these things for a purpose. So the 400 years of silence refers to the time between the Old and New Testament, during which time God did not speak to the Jewish people. The 400 years of silence began with a warning that then closed the Old Testament where he said in Malachi 4, 5, and 6, Behold, I am going to send you Elias, and which is Elijah. He was talking about 
the coming of John the Baptist. And he said, I'm going to send them the prophet before you in the coming great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And we understand then it's very clearly detailed in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi 3 and verse number 1. Behold, I will send my messenger. Now this is God prophesying through to the children of Israel. And he's talking about John the Baptist. I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. This is a prophecy about John the Baptist. Now, what is it about uh, this, this season of Israel? Because when you begin to look at the last book, this book of Malachi, you will find that Israel has now come out of captivity. Ezra has rebuilt the temple. They are uh, no longer in uh, under Babylonian. They're not under the uh, Medo-Persian empire rule. They are now back in the land and they have established the temple. But when you begin to read through the book of Malachi, you will see that they were going through religious uh, order. They were doing the service of the temple, but they were not honoring God. We'll find uh, things throughout Malachi where uh, they were not paying their tithe. They were robbing God. They were not honoring God in their service. They were doing the work, but they were not honoring God in the work. So how is that? Well, it's because lifestyle matters. You can do the work, but if you're not living for God, then God does not get honor out of you doing the work without truly living for him. So the temple was rebuilt. They were in the temple doing the work of the temple, yet they were not, Israel was, were not paying tithe. Israel were marrying, according to Malachi, they were marrying pagan wives, and they were not honoring the wives and that they had. They were not treating them uh, with, with dignity. And because of this, God looked at them and said, you know what, you're not in a place yet where you're ready for me. And so even though they were doing the work, they were not living the life. Now, that right there will preach. You can do the work, but you need to live the life. You can do the work of the ministry. It's it, it, it and, and I don't want to uh, go down a road that, that I don't need to go down, and I don't want to uh, insinuate anything. But it is possible. It is possible. And as your instructor, it's important for me to tell you this. It is possible to do the work of the ministry without really honoring God. You can do the work, and it becomes the job. It becomes what you just do. It's what you just... It, but there's no real honor in it. There's no real living for God in it. So the work and the lifestyle have to go together. If you do the work without the lifestyle, it will not honor God. And God will go silent during those times. Now, uh, there are many times, don't mistake God's silence for, well, you must be sinning. It's not like that. But during this period, God saw them do the work without the lifestyle, and God began to shape things. He began to put things in order. He began to put things in proper timing because now things are moving that are going to get Israel into a place that they remember God, that they're drawn back to God. And so as they done the work but refused to live the life, in short, the Jews were teaching, uh, were not, they were neglecting, they were neglecting to honor God in the temple, and they were not teaching people the ways of God. They were doing the work without the lifestyle. And so God began to move things as God began to give these warnings, and God began to tell them, I'm, there's coming a day that I'm going to send a forerunner. There's coming a day, and the silent years, in that moment, God began to ease where he was no longer speaking to Israel. They were doing the work without the lifestyle. God said there's coming a day, but God began to hold back his voice, his vision from Israel. So in 333 BC, Israel fell to the Greeks. Now this is part of the process. This is the silent years. Then again in 323, 10 years later, 
uh, the Greeks that had taken over Israel, then the Greeks fell to the Egyptians. And the Jews, they were generally treated with respect. They were allowed to retain certain jobs, certain jobs they could not. Matter of fact, during that time, you'll find that most Jews no longer were shepherds. They had become merchants. And so that as God began to shape them and move them, and then all the way through, then the Greeks took back over for uh, the Egyptians, then fell to the Greeks again. And it is in that moment that the Greeks began to put their culture into the Jews as we began that silent years. In the first decade of the silent years, they go from Greek being taken over by the Greeks to being taken over by the Egyptians to being taken over again by the Greeks. And at this moment... They begin to take on the culture of the Greeks. They begin to speak uh, Greek. They begin, matter of fact, that's why that the Septuagint was translated and very widely spread and quoted throughout the New Testament was in Greek. It's because of the Greek influence during the silent years. But all of this is leading up to something uh, because... Uh, now they are getting into a place that then the Greeks begin to war with the Romans and all of the things that, that, that begin to happen between the kingdoms as they begin to divide themselves and all of the leaders that begin to arise begin to position Israel. Why is this? Well, because remember in our last lesson, they were part of the, the crossroads of three continents. And so these armies going through, if they could control the bridge of the continents, then they could control the continent. So we find them uh, being ruled. And by the time you uh, start seeing some of the leaders arise and Epiphanes begin to arise and you see Hyrcanus begin to arise and Maccabeus begin to arise and all of these things that begin to, to have these political uh, context inside of Israel. Now you find that, that all of these, by the time you get to the coming time of the Lord, you find that scripture being fulfilled that we read in Galatians where Paul said in the fullness of time, all of these things had to happen. In other words, Israel was not ready under Ezra for Messiah. There were political things that had to happen. That The Romans needed to be in power. There were things that needed to be set up the thing that, that amazes me is they were so caught up in, in these 400 years. When you get toward the end of that, when the Lord or the angel Gabriel speaks to Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, and that is the moment that God spoke again to Israel. There's several things in this, and we really, in this lesson, uh, we would need more time than we have uh, to get into these things. But if you were to go into the book of Luke and just begin to read the book of Luke, chapter number one, verse number five through 17, you'll find Zacharias, it, 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 it got to the place in the political scene that Herod was now king. You get to the place that it, you, the, the, the Jews are being ruled by the Romans. Herod is king and every, everyone is under that power, but yet Zacharias is still doing the work of God. He is still in the temple, and they were both righteous before God. It's talking about Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth. They were righteous uh, before the Lord. They walked in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. They were blameless before the Lord. Now, <laughs> th this right here, and, and I'm trying to stay on, on subject here, but this will preach because they remained honorable before God. They remained righteous before the Lord. They kept the commandments of the Lord. God has not spoken for 400 years. They have not heard his voice. They have not heard of his. He has not spoke through a prophet. He has not spoke through an angel. What is happening? God is working, for lack of a better word, behind the scenes getting the political atmosphere to the place that the fullness of time would come to pass, that the word of the Lord in the Old Testament, hundreds of prophecies concerning Messiah and the political atmosphere of the coming of Messiah, all those things had to get into place. But Zacharias was still doing the work of the Lord, following the commandment of the Lord, even when God was silent. It was silent he did not understand the silence. He didn't know what was, how this was happening, but he followed and obeyed and kept what he knew was right, even when God was silent. Now that 
will preach because there will be times that God will be silent in your life. And sometimes it may be a day. Sometimes it may be a month. Well, for Israel, it was 400 years, but God was doing significant things in the background. He is working. Even when you don't see it, he's working. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. There are significant spiritual things happening. So this intertestamental period, God is preparing not only the spiritual climate of Israel, but he is preparing the political climate of the day. Because now the people that, that build the roads, the Romans were known for their road building. These things, I, I know that sounds so simple and some of you may be going, well, how does that fit our lesson? Those things made it easier for the gospel that was coming to spread. Every single detail. That is how detailed. That is why we serve a God that knows the very number of hair on our head, whether it's a lot or whether it's not. He's a very detailed God. So behind the scenes, even in his silence of the 400 years, significant things are happening. And God finds a man that says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be blameless before the Lord. In other words, I'm, I'm not going to support things that aren't godly. M remember in Malachi, they were doing the work, but they didn't have the lifestyle. But Zacharias did the work with the lifestyle. And God looks down and says, that's the man, the climate's now, the political climate's now, the spiritual climate's now, that I can fulfill in the fullness of time or in the completeness of God's picture he begins to set things in order. Isn't that incredible? I, I, I could get into that right now and talk about you sitting there in class right now. God has been working, putting things in order in your life from the very, even as he told Jeremiah, uh, before you were even born, when you were still in your mother's womb, I had a plan for you. And there have been times for you. God had a plan for you. God had a plan for me, has a plan for us. And, and we are at times going, God, what's the plan? God, where do I fit in? And God's saying, I know exactly what significant role you are going to play in the kingdom. And so there may be times that God is silent, but never mistake silence for a lack of significance because even in the intertestinal period, God was working. God was moving. God was moving kingdoms. God was moving people. And God still had a man that at the end of this time would still say, I'm going to be righteous before God. I'm not just going to do the work of the ministry, but I'm going to live the lifestyle of the ministry. Even when I don't hear from God, I'm not going to change the way I live for God. It's very important because I promise you this is a first year class. And I can assure you, there are going to be times in your ministry that you are going to be challenged to not just do the work of God, but to live the life for God. That will be a challenge. Don't let anybody rob you of your integrity. You're, don't let anybody rob you of your beliefs. Stand for what's right, even when God is silent. Obey his word. His word always speaks even when he is withholding his voice for a season. So when you can't hear the voice, you have to know, you have to remind yourself because the enemy will step in and say, oh, God's not speaking to you. You must be lost. He must not love you. He must have given up on you. No, you have to remind yourself, silence does not mean that God is, is, is not working. Silence, there is still significant, powerful things happening in the background. God is lining up things in your life just like he lined up for Israel. So now the roads are paved, the things are set, the way is set. Messiah can come and fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now, I mean, even the things of the prophecies of the Old Testament where, you know, cursed is he that hangeth upon a tree. The, the, it was the Romans that crucified. So all of these things had to be put in place before fullness of time would come. So even the 400 years between the Testaments was still a very, very vital, uh, significant things that were happening for Israel by the Lord. Now, the thing that we have to be careful for, even in the day that we're living in, is that while researching this, I, I found out that uh, it was during this 400 silent years 
when men got focused on the work more than the lifestyle, it was out of this that they began to model their political landscape according to those that had conquered them. And so it was out of that that the Sanhedrin came. It was out of that that the Sadducees and the Pharisees were developed. And we know that these were not just um, uh, religious leaders or religious uh, people of that day that had different views, some conservative, some uh, not so much. They were not just religious uh, leaders or religious groups. These were the political factors, and, and there were some very smaller branches, uh, but these were the major political figures of the day. And so when you find the silent years, you will find part of the reason that God remains silent is because his people were more focused on creating political systems than following the lifestyle of religions, things of God, of the law, of the things that, because they were under the law. They were more concerned with following a sect of politics than they were following the things of God. Now, I'm not going to time stamp this lesson today, uh, but it just that is a thing that is happening in our world today. But it is out of that it was out of men not living what they were preaching that led to religious systems that the Lord then came down in. But those systems had to be there to fulfill a purpose because it's it's the Sadducees and the Pharisees that end up coming against the Lord. It's them that, that lead him to being crucified and the people crying out. But all of that worked in the plan of, of God, because the plan of God is bigger than the Pharisees. The plan of God is bigger than the Sadducees. The plan of God is is bigger than men. It's bigger than anything. The plan of God will work. Why? Because there will always be a Zacharias. There will always be an Elizabeth that'll rise up and say, you know what? No matter if I have heard, no matter if he's silent, no matter what happens, I am going to remain living for God. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to follow the things of God. And so getting a grip or, or an understanding of, of what is going on in this day, then we find that of those 400 uh, silent years, when the Lord finds a man that is willing to do the work of God and live the lifestyle dedicated to God, it's then that the Lord comes, sends an angel Gabriel and speaks to Zacharias and tells him that his wife is going to bear a son. And he marvels because he's, well, my wife is barren. How is she going to bear a son? But then this is the forerunner that Malachi spoke of. This is an exciting moment because uh, Zacharias has not seen angels before, but I love it because it even says in Luke uh, chapter number one, I, I, I love how Luke writes uh, it's very fascinating to me, and he's very detailed in the way that he writes. He's very compassionate, but very detailed. And, and, and when you look at Luke, he gives this glimpse, but he says that, that when, when uh, Zacharias comes out from the temple, that, that the people knew he couldn't even speak because uh, he, you know of what the angel had, had smote his voice, but he couldn't even speak, but he comes out of the temple, and the people know, and he is and gone through this and this, this process. But it says, Luke says that there were people with outside of the temple and they were going through the things of God and they were worshiping and they had to, there was joy and gladness. And, and it amazes me because God had a people that were in a place where they were, were tired of, of being ruled over by manners and customs that were not of God. They were in a place where they were hungry for something more of God. And God said, now is the time. God is looking for somebody that'll say, you know what? Yes, we've gone through a lot and we've done a lot and we've seen a lot, but there is a time, there is a place that God is saying, if you will begin to call unto me, God is looking for people that will, will live the life and he will speak and move in powerful ways. And so we know that it was through that process that Alexander the Great had gone through and we spoke of that very briefly about how he brought in the Greek cultures and the Greek colonies and how that led 
into how the, the Lord was working, and we spoke of those different rulers uh, of, of Epiphanes, and we talked about our, um, Arcanus, and we spoke of Maccabeus. And now, you know, when you begin to look at how God led these things and set this up, it amazes me. But the, the thing you've got to get out as we get ready to close our lesson, the thing that you've got to understand is that there is a, a fullness of time at work. The silence began when people went through the motions of working for God but refused to live the life of God, the lifestyle. But the silence ended when they found a man that was willing to not only do the work of the temple but was willing to live the lifestyle before God. That is how God moves and works in the spirit realm. But God is so involved in the world that he used this period of silence to work significantly in the background of Israel's life. And God is doing the very same thing in our lives. God is working significantly in our lives. And so as this relates in closing, as this relates to the life and times of Christ, now we get the idea of the political climate of the days of the Lord. Now the silence is broken. The angel has spoken to Zacharias. Now the silence is broken. Gabriel then speaks to Mary, a young Mary, about the coming of the Lord. Now the silence is broken, and we are now thrust into that time to where now we're beginning that the process of knowing the true times of Jesus. We've gone through the Old Testament. We've gone through the silence. We found a man that was willing to live for God and a woman that was willing to live for God and do the work of God with the lifestyle of God. And now the, the political nature has all come to pass and the right people are in the right place. Herod's in the right place. The roads are set in the right place. Every detail is set. It's right. Now the process begins to where we can understand the climate and times of the Lord and now we can begin to enter into that next phase of how the gospel will come about, the miracles will work, and how salvation will come and then spread across the entire world. God is so very detailed that he takes care of every area of our lives. Body, soul, spirit takes care of every details of the world. God is in control. God is working. He's just looking for a man and a woman that'll say, I want to do the work of the ministry and I want to live the life that God called me to live. God bless you. Looking forward to our next lesson, lesson number four. We're going to continue into the process of the times of Jesus. And we're going to have a really, really great time. God bless you. Love each and every one of you. Believe in each and every one of you. If you have any questions, please feel free to, to message me or uh, talk to your instructor that's there helping you with the videos. Please talk to them. Let them know you have a question. Do not hesitate. There are no big questions, no small questions. If I don't have the answer again, I will help you find that answer and we'll learn and grow together. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day.